Hi. Hi guys. Hey, hey how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> how is everyone? Okay, okay. Hi. How are you? <laughs> yeah, not, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's uh, certainly strange times. Everyone is experiencing the same thing in a very sort of unique way. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but the longer the longer this goes on for, I imagine the certainly the harder it is for, for each and every one of you. It's very nice to see the familiar faces on here. <laughs> <laughs> um, how's how's it been? Where do, where do we where do, where do we even start? Like I I I've heard from from friends, from all sorts of people in the conversations that I've had, the things that I've seen online and things that get sent to me on different people dealing with this situation in different ways, but but you guys, it's a whole different ball game when you have children. And then in Craig's case, I think you have four children. Uh, Leanne, you have three. Yeah. Um, you are you are you know locked up in your in your house with with the children running around. How do you? Where do you, where, where where do you even start? How do you cope with that? Um. Well, I I'll start, Craig, if you if you like. It's um, yeah, okay. it's it's terrifying in a nutshell. Um, Rachel um, has been a lifeline to us as a well child nurse. But uh, in brief, with I know we've spoken before, but with Sophie's needs, with her cerebral palsy, with her chronic lung disease, she has a tracheostomy. She's ventilated. Um, she has, you know, we sat and after speaking to Colin yesterday, we sat and I just counted just knowing we're going to speak in today, just the volume of medications that she has throughout a day. And on average, she has 45 medications a day, up to nearly 60 for anything PRN if there's an emergency. So the volume of medication she's given throughout a 24 hour period, not to mention the, the level of care that we're delivering, whether that be nebulizers, uh, whether we need to give her emergency medication if she has a seizure, um, personal care because we do everything. I mean, Sophie, is amazing you'll probably remember she's a staff a young teenager now um, and she has an amazing personality but she does need a high level of care and we need to give her that so the virus aside that doesn't stop we still have to give that volume of care 24 7 7 days a week and now with the virus on top of everything else with us in isolation and lockdown i can't really even put into words just how scary a time it is so we're, we, we carry on and we give the care that we would, would normally give, but we're constantly getting different bits of information from different areas. So there might be ventilation circuits in short supply. We might be struggling to get medication. We might have a carer that can't come in. So there's lots of different things we're trying to manage on top of that to ensure that safety still get that high level of care and that we're, we're well, we're staying safe and that we don't become unwell and her, her sisters don't get the virus. and Aside from that, it's just a very, very isolating, very isolating time. It's so surreal because, and I'm sure Craig and others will agree, we're we're a very sociable family. We know we don't hide Sophie. She's she's always out there doing all sorts of stuff. And um, so I think, aside from being terrified of what's what's going on and trying to protect her, it's very, very isolating, and it's just such a surreal, scary time. But I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis, it is incredibly challenging for for all you, all you guys. Now this is just this has taken it to to a whole new level. I mean, Craig, how are you how are you coping? How are you looking after yourself and all the kids? And without a real sort of an end in sight, what is what is day to day like for you? Yeah, it's, um, uh, it's similar to Leanne. We're, it's scary. You know, that is the first thing the way I would describe it. Yeah, we are frightened because we know. Um, if the virus gets in our house, if you know, if it, you know, if Fraser, you know, contracts the virus, then you know, we know the implications of that are quite severe, and we also don't know how we would cope with any sort of hospital admission, you know, because it would need one of us to go with him. Who goes? Who looks after him? Um, I actually um, had some of the symptoms a couple of weeks ago, so I spent a week in isolation in the house in isolation. Um, and unfortunately, we had room for me to be able to do that, but that was just you know, terrifying for us, really. Um, our, our day to day, if anything, has got busier because um, Fraser's care needs are such that, you know, it's several hours in the morning, it's several hours in the evening before he goes to bed and then it's ongoing all day. Um, 
our other children, and, and they're all sort of um, young adults now. All our children are, are young adults now. So during this period, Fraser's grown his first full beard, which is interesting for him. So, <laughs> um, but we have other children who are vulnerable as well. We have another child with diabetes who also has um, some mental health issues at the moment, and he needs care, really. So Ellis is caring for him, caring for Fraser. Um, we have our other children home. One of them works away, one of them is at university. We've got them home. So our day-to-day -day is actually busier than it ever has been. And we are in full isolation. We haven't got any carers coming in. So we are sort of dealing with all of Fraser's care needs um, himself, uh, ourselves rather. And um, I'm also still working. So I'm sort of sat working for you know, a, a full day, a, a long full day. We're managing, but it's harder than it usually is. We haven't got um, the resources. Fraser's at college, he can't go to college. We haven't got his respite center open. Um, so, you know, it, it, it just is frightening, really. Um, we're getting all the supplies in that we need to get, but we do, we're all, always worried that they're going to run out. We're not going to get the prescriptions that we need. Similar case in terms of medications to to Liam, um, but how, you know, how often do you need the? Um, how often do you need uh, another delivery of medication? Uh, it's probably a couple of times a week. It comes because some of them they um, they have limited um, time expiry periods. So we are getting uh, regular pharmacy deliveries, um, and, and we're fortunate our local pharmacy is delivering, which is really helpful to us. Um, and with other supplies, we've got friends who are dropping off at the doorstop and um, uh, we have a click and collect shopping area where we're sort of collecting shopping once a week. And that's the only time we leave the house, really. Wow. And, and the community around you, uh, do people know your situation? Are people there to, to help? Are they checking in or are they, are they sort of so immersed in their, in their own stuff that they're, they're trying to cope, uh, you know, separately? Yeah, we have, we have some good friends and carers. We, we don't have any family local to us, which isn't great. Um, but we have sort of carers and friends who are, and my daughter's friends who are running errands for us, doing things for us and keeping us going, really. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, moving on to Rachel, I mean, how, how many years now have you been a well child nurse? I've been a well child nurse only six years now. Um, I belong to a small specialist team that support children who require long term ventilation across our region, that's Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire and Derbyshire. Uh, we've got a growing number of children out there and the need for ventilation is because they've got chronic health needs, chronic respiratory needs. So these are exactly the kind of children that we do not want contracting this virus at all costs. So I know from my working experience, things have changed dramatically. You know, my role is up in the community, seeing these children, visiting them at home. And for the last three weeks, I've not seen a patient face to face because we are uh, trying to uh, shield these families and make sure they stay safe, but also protect ourselves a certain way. But we are absolutely prioritising where we need to go if we need to go out. So we have to try and do different things, try and do like this, do video conferencing, telephone conferencing where we can to try and speak to families and offer them some sort of support and help where we can. And I say, like, exactly like Leanne said, make some headway through all the new guidance and try and be that central hub source of information and support during this what is a really challenging time for everybody yeah. i mean apart from the really obvious medical need that clearly everyone needs but especially these guys what is is there is there something else that, that the last how many weeks it's been now three four weeks is it is anything else jumped out as you've been doing these visits and you've been speaking to people through zoom through facetime through whatever yeah. way of communicating is there something that sort of jumped out to you that you're quite concerned about? Yeah, I mean, a lot, just like Leanne said and Craig, a lot of our families require external care and external help. You know, these children, a lot of children need round the clock care 24 hours a day. Uh, you can't expect parents often to do that on their own. So they have to open their doors at this vulnerable time to external carers, which is a huge concern for them and a huge risk potentially. Um, but, you know, some families have chosen, like Craig, to stop all external care. Some families have decided to carry on with care. And it's trying to do what we can to make sure that, I mean, there's a lot of issue regarding uh, personal protective equipment and the clothing needed that 
what the staff and what families are expected to wear and literally I can honestly say on a daily basis we're getting different guidelines as to what is needed and the guidelines come out and often the supply seems to be lacking or slow to be fulfilled um, and I think if we can perhaps get that as an issue sorted first and foremost then there can be an element of reassurance for the families and for the carers that they can carry on fulfilling their caring role because the last thing we want is to say these children and their families because actually the families are just as important as the children so you know to come down with this virus yeah, I mean, you, you're asked to do extraordinary things every single day and how you do it you never know after the last whatever 11 years or almost 12 years of uh, being connected to world child it, talk about super parents i mean super mums super dads yeah. super nurses. It's, it's amazing, and even when you're a nurse, you've got your own family to look after, and other people yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Wow, I mean, I, there's so much res respect for all you guys. I mean, Colin, you know, World Child, where is, where is World Child right, right now? From a fundraising point of view, bearing in mind so much has had to be cancelled. I know the World Child Awards, uh, you know, that were due to be, I think, in September, or at least around that time, is still very much up in the air, and you're not sure what to do, but you know, to, to everybody watching, how do we, how do we help? How do we help World Child? How do we help the nurses? How do we help the families? What can we, what can we do? What can everybody do? There's a couple of things really, most important things. I mean, Rachel touched on supplies. So things like PPE have been in the news a huge amount, um, but other supplies, basic supplies, food and cleaning products and sanitizer gels and all those things. What we're, what we're hearing in the well child family tree from the thousands of families who interact in there is that, that a lot of these families are finding it very difficult to get themselves included on what, what are being called vulnerable lists so because these families are, we always say at well child these families are all, always isolated and always hidden and now they're more isolated and more hidden than ever before and actually getting getting recognition that they are amongst the most vulnerable people that we've got in the country at the moment is really tough because the focus isn't on families like this. So then that impacts on their ability to get hold of supplies and even some basic things. So uh, with Wellchild, we're adapting ourselves to try and see how we can fill that gap and work with other agencies to try and do, and, and also just to, 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 to keep pushing the message that these are vulnerable families that need to be included in that sort of thing. And I think, Rachel and I have had a couple of discussions this week that have touched on how vulnerable some of these families are, yet they can't mm. access this additional support that's out there. And that's a big worry for us. Supplies and being acknowledged as vulnerable, I think, I don't know, Rachel, if you agree, probably at the moment for us is the most important thing. Yeah, I think it, and uh, you um, released that really practical like guide, you know, and things like that. It's just sharing some experiences and offering the families with the family tree they've got a chance to share their experiences and share their ideas and thoughts you know it's trying to be work together um it's really it is it's a really really tricky time for everybody and i think you know whether you're a health professional a parent anybody charity it just seems to be challenging us all and i say it's all about working as a team to try and do what we can to support these families i think i know from us as a well child nurses network I find the help from the other nurses on the network invaluable, you know, that we come across an issue and a concern that we then are able to share it and put it out there on the nurses network and get some really valuable information. And hopefully that will benefit then the wider community and why, you know, the children at home. Yeah. And you're absolutely right to touch on the awards, you know, and which we were hoping, but we're still hoping is September. It sort of highlights this, the, the big issue for the charities, nobody, nobody in the world knows how long this is going to take. Yeah. And, and from a, you know, so on the one hand, Wellchild and lots of other charities are in the middle of trying to adapt to help the very people we're here to help. But on the other hand, we're in survival mode. You know, we're trying to make sure that we can access as much funding uh, and as much income as we can so that the other side of this, we're still here because families will need us more than ever then anyway. And, and we've lost, you know, already a lot of income through events and things that, that we know are going to disappear. And that impact could last for years. So it's sort of that dual thing for, for charities like Wellchild now, making sure that we're working hard for families, but making sure the charity can survive at the same time. 
you know, you, you, you touched on something there, the, the recovery is going to take, is going to take a long time for, for everybody, um, especially for the charitable sector um, and charities like World Child. But, um, you know, I think in the, in the immediate term, it's, it's really about, as Rachel sort of touched on there, it's about supporting each other, right? Because if the, if, if, if the equipment's hard to get and, and, it's, and it's hard to actually visit people or be able to get out, then just being able to speak to each other, whether it's, again, on Zoom, FaceTime, whatever it is, just to be able to communicate and, and draw some strength from other people. Because I don't know how you guys feel, but presumably some days are way worse than other days. Uh, and some days are okay. It, you know, we've got, in some cases, the, there's the added asset of having more pairs of hands to help. But at the same time, depending on how old those children are, it can completely turn the opposite way as, um, as well. Yeah, um, completely. So from, from our point of view, um, and obviously you'll be aware of lots of families that are supported by World Child. So some have agency staff, some don't have carers. Uh, we have like a joint budget. So we have social care funding as well as a personal health budget. So that basically means that we can employ our own staff. So we're essentially carrying on the way we would normally would do. But as well as trying to shield Sophie and her sisters, I also have a health condition which makes me immunosuppressed, so I have to shield as well. But I'm also trying to protect the staff. I have a duty of care to the staff to make sure that I'm putting everything in place to make sure it's safe for them to come to work and remain as a key worker for Sophie. Um, but the, the information that we're getting, and I think Colin referred to it earlier, that there's, there's a lot of information out there but there's not a lot for vulnerable families and there's certainly not a lot for children with complex needs, medical needs that are having that sort of support from well child. So whilst we've been shielding and kind of, you know, trying to be upbeat and take each day as it comes, I'm also trying to manage the staff. So some days you just touched upon it then. Some days it's so stressful. I get up at five in the morning and I'm still trying to do admin and try and get answers to make sure it's safe for the carers to come to work because I would hate to put them in a position where they didn't have the right equipment and they're then susceptible to getting the virus and then that would be on my head I don't know if you agree Craig so there's lots of other things that we're you know we're protecting our family but we're also making sure we're protecting the carers so that they can come to work to support us but essentially if we're then in a position where we don't have any care because they might be symptomatic or they're too scared to come to work there is no way we would survive when Sophie needs seven nights a week seven days a week you know, 24 hour care, seven days a week, and if we had no care, that's the scary thought from us. I don't know where we would be in a few weeks' time, a few months' time, because, you know, the goalposts keep moving. We don't know what's going to happen, how long we're going to be in isolation, how long we're going to be in lockdown, and it is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, and our, our situation is sort of slightly different in the fact that we sort of took the decision not to have carers in. Um, partly to protect the carers, partly to um, isolate us. Um, but that uh, feeling of isolation and that sort of the, um, the combination of tiredness, because you know, Fraser's had a couple of days where he was ill and we, you know, we thought he was potentially going down with the virus and as a result he had really bad nights. So Self and Ellis were up a lot, you know, almost whole night and then the next day doing caring duties and, and working and sort of doing all the things you have to do. If that went on for any significant period of time, you know, you can only do it so much. We would do it, but it's just really, really exhausting. Uh, um, and the other thing I would say is that, you know, we haven't got a lot of contact with other parents, other people, and the well child family tree has been really supportive in sort of, you know, seeing other people in the same circumstances, seeing what they're doing, being able to help them as well well so being able to give our own sort of commentary of you know this is our position and sort of supporting families through it I think that's been really valuable I don't know if you've felt that Leanne you know, Absolutely. You know we've seen that develop over the years and I think yeah. during this crisis it's just been fantastic to see the support it's given yeah the community, the community spirit is, uh, is 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 stronger than it's ever been but um how do you how do you guys manage how do you manage the stress I mean Craig I know probably just being able to go lock yourself away in, in a separate room, albeit working, but a slight distraction from, from, from what, you've, what you're doing constantly. But what is it, I mean, bear in mind, there's gonna be other people watching this as well, maybe in a similar situation, maybe in a completely different situation. But for you guys, is there a way that you are able to manage this stress? 
is there is there some tips that you might be able to give to other people um you know I think how <laughs> There's lots of things out there and I, I had this conversation with Colin yesterday and I'm terrible for not listening to my own advice because if I was within the family tree right now I'd be saying you know read a book go run in and um, have a bath there's calm apps headspace there's all sorts of apps but I don't listen to my own advice for me um, I, I sure because I can't go out I can't go for a walk or run because I'm shielding with Sophie and um, so just being able to get out in the garden and as I mentioned before Sophie is so sassy so for me it's actually making sure I'm enjoying the family time so I need to remind myself as much as I'm getting stressed and getting frustrated with, you know, trying to get the communication right, trying to speak to the professionals, trying to get the PPE equipment, I have to remind myself to step away. If I step away and then making sure I'm enjoying that quality time with the family, everything just seems to, you know, everything goes back and I'm just like, okay, I'm all right now. You know, we might be throwing paint around in the garden, we might be baking bread, whatever <laughs> it is we're doing just enjoying that quality family time you see it's quite an easy way to then forget the stresses and the worries of what's going on out there at the moment yeah. i must admit we've been really amazed during this sorry during this time where we are getting literally daily text messages and photographs of the families who are sharing their experiences and you know a lot there's a lot of fun going on i know it's yeah. a worrying time <laughs> and everybody is really really worrying but there's also a lot of fun and a lot of family time going on in those houses and it's it is really lovely to see i think this is great we just don't know hopefully it's not going to be too much longer but we just don't know and you know it's trying like you say liana you know you know in your family and you all are that actually you know to share their experiences is absolutely fantastic and it's amazing because look at your faces now I know. <laughs> you can deal with it in such, with such grace right and yeah. i think it's really important for people to remember that just because just because you as a parent or as anybody can sit there now smiling being like this this is fine like but what's actually going on in your mind and the experiences that you've had over the last few weeks and in some, some cases maybe years and, you know the resilience and the strength that you guys have is absolutely incredible oh, yeah. um, and you must never ever 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 forget that and of course there's going to be hard days i can't even begin to imagine how hard it is for you guys you're having one kid at 11 months old <laughs> <laughs> so, to see what you guys uh, are going through on a, on a day to day basis, honestly, so much respect to every single one of you. Um, and, to, and to Rachel, to you, you know, as you quite rightly say, there is, there's a hell of a lot of positives that are, that are happening at the same time. And being able to have family time, so much family time that you almost think, oh, do I, do I feel guilty <laughs> for having so much family time as well? well you, you've, got to, you've got to celebrate those moments where you just are on the floor rolling around in hysterics because of something that's happened and then there's inevitably half an hour later maybe a day later there's going to be something that you have to deal with and there's no way that you can run away from it you can't even distract yourself in a different room but as long as you guys are looking after yourselves and looking after each other that is the best that you can do i think you've hit the nail Absolutely. on the head there sort of making you know remembering to laugh and have fun one of the things we've started to do with safety and i don't know whether i'm going to live to regret it but she really loves me reading her stories and, and Rachel you'll know from every time she's been in ICU and I want to do the silly voices and all the Disney voices and yeah. so she wants me to read her story so we read the story but mummy has to do the really ridiculous silly voices so we've been recording them and sharing them with her friends and we're going to be recording them and sharing them with World Child so World Child obviously we've been doing quite a bit with the World Child TV so um so you never know I could send it your way for Archie and you could have a little story there <laughs> you're a shining example of, of, of just being super parents, I say just, being a super parent and, and spinning so many plates and juggling so many balls at the same time. It's amazing, it really is amazing. And, and to see you smiling and you know, either grinning and bearing it or genuinely just like, this is, this is life. It's, to a certain extent, there's, there's not much that you can do about it except where is the, where is the light at the end of the tunnel? Let's focus on that. And, and keep the morale up because it, it's all about morale. If morale is up, if you're waking up in the morning going, right, new day, got my whole family here, what are we gonna do? Of course, there's that fear of what might happen, but there's so much that's out of our control. And all of a sudden, we now realize how small we are in the, in the, in the grand scheme. I think, it's, I think that's, that's so true. And, and Rachel, as I say, Rachel and I have had a couple of conversations and we focus very much on you know, increased stress levels with families, increased need trying to to make sure everybody can access what they need and then when you when you you just get underneath that a little bit and you look and, and some of the stuff in the family tree 
that spirit remains. You know, that spirit that we've seen at the awards over the years, which we always talk about the same thing. Well, that spirit remains. And actually, what we see with the, in the small family unit, we actually see across the whole of the well child family with people supporting each other in that way. And that makes such a difference that people who, you know, are opposite ends of the country are able to support each other because they're going through exactly the same thing. And, yeah. and to then draw the positives out of that. And we've seen so much of that good stuff as well, which is so important. You're so right. And I've, I've always thought that if you've, been through, if you've been through difficult times, right, because every single person has something going on behind, behind those eyes, behind that smile. There's always something going on. In some cases, there's a lot. In some cases, there's little. In some cases, people try and blank it all out. But it is, I think, when you've been through hard times, you really, you come out so much stronger, not just for yourself and not just for your family, but for other people as well. And certainly from a mental, mental health point of view, if you've ever been through that, you want to make sure that no one else struggles or no one else goes through what you went through. Um, and it's so nice to know that you've got this community um, where people can actually you know, share experiences and just, just check in because that at the end of the day is, is, a, is a really good place to start. I almost, before we finish, I almost want to cause a bit of chaos and invite um, all the children in, at least the children that are able to get to the camera. Are they, are they <laughs> here? Are they bad idea? <laughs> I may have to go for a little walk, then we'll go and find Sophie. Yeah, <laughs> Carry on talking amongst yourselves. Yeah, I'll go see if any of mine are available. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rosalie. Here we go. Let me see. <laughs> Sophie, <laughs> can you remember who I said I was going to be speaking to today? There she is. Who's here? Um, hi, Sophie. Look, who's that? <laughs> Hello. Hello, and Rachel's there. Look at that. Hello, hi, Sophie. Nice to see you again. You recognise Rachel? It's probably way yeah. more. <laughs> I forget a smile. Remember? Razor as well. Hi, Sophie. Hello. Hello. Oh, got Sean a sheep oh. in your window from when we did the well chaff up oh, today. Yeah. You remember? <laughs> how we made you Sean the sheep. It's still in your window, isn't it's it? Still, still in the window. Yeah, yeah. So. She's still yeah. got it. <laughs> Hello, Sophie. <laughs> And there's Craig, look, there's Craig. Yeah, Craig. Craig, how are you doing? Craig. <laughs> <laughs> He's a bit shell-shocked. Is it dancing, isn't it? Yeah. I'll just try and hold it. Craig, Craig, um, how's everyone coping? Are we, are we okay? Oh, it's a whole family team. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, so this is exactly what we were talking about. How many of your family are all in one space, probably for the first time ever, and <laughs> How My other two are completely camera shy oh. and won't come to the uh, so That is causing a bit of chaos for them. <laughs> wow. There we go, there's one. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, how, how are you all coping? To, to Craig's family first, to the Hatch family, how are you guys coping? Are you all, are you all okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so. You're all looking after each other, you're not causing too much chaos, you're helping mum and dad. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you've, got your, you've got your plate full, but morale seems to be well done. Um, Leanne, who else is there? Uh, so this is Erica, Sophie's twin. Hi guys, how are we doing? Um, are, we, are we coping? Yeah, she's gone camera shy. <laughs> oh, and then I've got my, my husband, who's also called Craig. Hi. Craig. <laughs> hey, Craig. You look as though you, look as though you go know. to the gym quite a lot. Is that is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> he said you go to the gym quite a lot. All right. <laughs> well, listen, guys. I just I just wanted to say hello and well done, you guys. Look, it's it's not it's not just the mums and dads who are super like you as as kids. No matter what age you are, none of you should be in this situation. None of us should be in this situation, but we are and you are doing everything you can to make it to easier for, for your mum and dad to, to, to look after your, your brother, to your, your sister, like full respect to every, every single one of you because this is hard on everyone, but it is especially hard on you. Um, and I know that you know, Colin and Will Child are doing everything they can to support you guys. And hopefully uh, through this video and other things, um, we will be able to, to, to make it more clear and obvious to, to government and to everybody else that you know, these you guys are you guys are in the in the vulnerable vulnerable bracket, and well child needs more help. So it's really really nice to see you all smiling, happy, 
keep going, keep the morale up, keep yourselves busy, keep being creative, keep doing new things, dare yourselves to do new hobbies. And uh, yeah, I, I hope to see you all again very, very soon. Yeah, Andrew, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.